Okay, we're going to say a prayer first. We'll stand and say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, and fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by light of the Holy Ghost, grant that by gift of the same Spirit, that we may be always truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Please be seated. So we continue on uh, with our catechism, and the catechism today is covering the fifth commandment. We have covered the fourth commandment extensively, not completely. As you know, many of the hours or minutes were spent just fleshing out the responsibility of the fourth commandment, meaning that it extends all the way out into society, into our daily business, especially with the construction of the family and the state, so the government. So remember that book by Father Cahill, The Christian State, Establishing a Christian State. That's a very thick book, very important book for understanding how the historical development and structure of the Catholic home, or let's say Catholic state, should be. So now we go on to the fifth commandment. Doesn't mean we can't go back to talking about the structure of a Catholic state or the guilds, the guilds and the construction of a Catholic organization. You know that here in the parish, we started the Holy Name Society. That's like a fledgling or a little seed of where the men can then themselves start to look at their workplace and establish it on Catholic principles. So in a way, the Holy Name Society in this parish is like a guild to promote the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, to protect his name against blasphemy. And then, of course, hopefully they can sanctify their souls in this union of men who pray for one another, who sacrifice for one another. The fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. We'll, we'll cover this first, and then I have a little bit of information um, that I'd like to give you as kind of a second or third part, unmasking the faces of the Antichrist. Uh, according to Dr. Wolfgang Smith, a friend of mine who lives in Camarillo. The importance of instruction on this commandment, the Council of Trent tells us, the great happiness proposed to the peacemakers of being called the children of God should prove a powerful incentive to the pastor, and that's myself, to explain to the faithful with care and accuracy the obligations imposed by this commandment. No means more efficacious can be adopted to promote peace among mankind than the proper explanation of the commandment and its holy and due observance by all. I know that many of us have in our minds, you know, What's a just war? Can there be such a thing as capital punishment? What does it mean to kill someone in battle by a, by a soldier? What about the difference between someone who shoots somebody innocently on the sidewalk? Also, that's all external. Also internally, what do I wish to do as harm to my neighbor in my thoughts, in my words? That's another way of killing. We'll cover that. The necessity of explaining this commandment is proved from the following. Immediately after the earth was overwhelmed in a universal deluge, we call that the flood, the time of Noah, this was the first prohibition made by God to man. This fifth command was the first prohibition. He said, I will require the blood of your lives at the hand of every beast and at the hand of man. In the next place, among the precepts of the old law, expounded by our Lord, this commandment was mentioned first by him, concerning which it is written in the Gospel of St. Matthew, it has been said, thou shalt not kill, etc. So us, we are the faithful. On our part, you should hear with willing attention the explanation of the commandment, since its purpose is to protect the life of each one. You know what we said before? 
If we were to make the Ten Commandment tablets, there are three on this one, and there are the other ten. Oh, sorry, the other seven. So the other seven are concerning our neighbor. So this is God, and this is our neighbor. So now we've transitioned. We have talked about this extensively in other catechism classes about the first, second, and third commandment. We talked about the fourth commandment already. And now we're on the fifth. And so being on the fifth commandment, we're dealing with our neighbor. And our relation to our neighbor requires that I don't kill him, that I don't harm him. As we said just here from the Council of Trent. What is our purpose in this commandment? I lost my place. There we go. Is that we protect the life of each one. These words, thou shalt not kill, emphatically forbid homicide. And they should be heard by all the same pleasure as if God talked to you directly. Naming each individual. If he came to you individually and said, do not do this. We should still take this commandment as coming from him. So... To prohibit injury, to be offered him under a threat of the divine anger and the heaviest chastisements. As then the announcement of this commandment must be heard with pleasure. So also should the avoidance of the sin, which it forbids, give pleasure. So I hope you understand that. Each commandment has a prohibitory as aspect and a commanding aspect. And whatever is contained in that commandment, we should want to do it with pleasure. To avoid hurting somebody else and to fulfill it because God gave it to me. There's two parts of the commandment then. Twofold obligation. One is prohibitory. That's a forbidding to kill. The other is mandatory. And commands us to cherish sentiments of charity, concord, friendship towards our enemies. So we know that the greatest of all commandments God gave to us is love. And so, love of God, love of neighbor. Love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and thy whole soul and thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, that being the case, this commandment is protecting that. Yes, there's something prohibitory about it. Negative, you might say. Do, oh, do not kill. But this says, cherish love and support. So it's in that commandment. Okay, we continue. It even, it even it pushes us to patience. So this is, we're seeking concord, which means working together, and patience. That's something we have to think about. We always look at the negative, don't we? Do not, do not, do not. That's how they're written. Except for the fourth commandment, honor their father and their mother. Keep holy the Sabbath day. Those are positives up front. But normally they have a negative connotation up front. Why would that be? Why should I have a negative? What We're all about positivity this day, these days. And we want to be very kind to our neighbor. And we don't want to do anything negative. Why is that, that the commandment so up front? with do not, because that's, we have to be stopped. Once you're stopped in your tracks from doing something wrong, then you reflect and say, ah, oh, but what should I be doing? What's the opposite? And that's here. Okay, so we're stopped in our tracks. It makes sense that God said, do not, in order that we can reflect and do better. Well, think of the, his Hebrews at the time, those, um, of his chosen people who he, you know, knew were doing a lot of bad things. And then he sent Moses down the hill with the commandments. First of all, why do we need 10 commandments? Isn't it sufficient to be written in our hearts, which it is by natural law. It's always written in our hearts, what God wants from us, but we get dull. We get jaded, ignorant, and we need to have it spelled out. God spelled it out on the Ten Commandment tablets. 
So what is the prohibitory part of this commandment? That's the thou shalt not kill. Okay, there's an exception, the killing of animals. With regard to the prohibitory part, it should first be taught what kind of killing are not forbidden by this commandment. It is not prohibited to kill an animal, for if God permits man to eat them, then it's lawful to kill them. When, says St. Augustine, we hear the words, thou shalt not kill, we do not understand this of the fruits of the earth, which are insensible, nor of irrational animals, which form no part of human society. Okay, so there's different levels of animals, you know that, all the way from the little, little things that seem to be partly animal and partly plant, all the way up to us. Different parts, we are all part of the animal kingdom, except that a man has an immortal soul. A man is the highest of all the creatures. Okay, just one little, um, it was always good to insert a little humor here. I talk about you have to kill an animal to be able to eat it, and we're not forbidden to eat animals. Well, some city slicker went out to a ranch, and he saw a dog with three legs. Now, this often happens to a dog with, if he's out on a ranch, he may have gotten his leg stuck in a fence, in a trap, in a truck, in a machinery. It's gone, or maybe a cow stepped on it. All right, so there's a dog, three legs. And the city slicker says to the farmer, the rancher, oh, what happened to that dog? It has three legs. He says, yeah, good dog like that can't eat all at once. Imagine how that shocked the city slicker. <laughs> okay, the execution of criminals. Another kind of lawful slayings belongs to the civil authorities to whom it is entrusted power of life and death by the legal and judici judicious exercise of which they punish the guilty and protect the innocent. Very important. What is the purpose of the civil law? To punish the guilty and protect the innocent. The just use of this power, far from involving the crime of murder, is an act of paramount obedience to this commandment, which prohibits murder. The end of the commandment is the preservation and security of human life. Now, the punishments inflicted by the civil authority, which is the legitimate avenger of crime, naturally tend to this end, since they get security to life by repressing outrage and violence, something we had a hard time seeing at the time of the COVID and all those uprisings and violence. We hardly saw the civil authority doing their job. Hence, these words of David, King David, in the morning I put to death all the wicked of the land, that I might cut off all the workers of iniquity from the city of the Lord. So what's he trying to do, David? He's trying to protect the city of the Lord, the city of God. Read the life of Garcia Moreno of Ecuador. Beautiful life, great story, strong president, good Catholic man, a gentleman. He had to put some guys, <laughs> men, brigands to death because of what they were doing to his state, to the order he was establishing that was Catholic. What about killing in a just war? You're a soldier, you're a Navy man, you're a Marine, you're an Air Force, Personnel, what about you? In like manner, the soldier, any soldier is guiltless who actuated not by motives of ambition or cruelty, but by a pure desire of serving the interests of his country, takes away the life of an enemy in a just war. Furthermore, there are on record instances of carnage executed by the special command of God. We see that in the Old Testament. The sons of Levi who put to death so many thousands one day were guilty of no sin. And when the slaughter had ceased, they were addressed by Moses in these words. You have consecrated your hands this day to the Lord. It's not what we like to hear in our sensitive world. Because we're all about a type of good, but not God's good. Not the good of truth and the good of grace. It's something else. Like we don't want to, yeah. It's a misplaced, a misplaced sense of order. 
We have to keep thinking of the common good of mankind, the common good of our families, of your family. That's the problem. Many families fall apart because one individual or a couple of them, oh, it's all about me. It's all about my selfishness. That's what I want to do. And it ruins a family. What about the incident of killing by accident? You're driving down the road. You run over somebody by accident. Some other accident, some failure. What, what, what does the Council of Trent say about that? Again, death caused not by intent or design, but by accident is not murder. He that killeth his neighbor ignorantly, says the book of Deuteronomy, and who is proved to have had no hatred against him yesterday and the day before, but to have gone with him to the wood, to hew wood and cutting down the tree, the ax slip out of his hand and the iron slipping from the handle, struck his friend and killed him. That happens. I remember when we were cutting wood, it's very easy even when you're working in the snow and ice, the whole handle is covered with ice and you're swinging your ax, you just go Phew. It happens. Such accidental deaths, because inflicted without intent or design, involve no guilt, whatever. But let's take the example of a drunk driver. Young man partying with his friends, drinks alcohol, is drunk, intoxicated, should not be driving on the road, takes the four others with him in the car, crashes and kills them, and he lives. Is he guilty of murder? Yes. That wasn't an accident. The accident would be that he was driving down the road and there was ice on the road or some other thing that he couldn't control. But he can control his own drinking. He can tr control the choice of driving. Well, he should have. So those are quite different. But you can see the difference. One guy who's just driving down the road and suddenly the tire blows and he crashes and one of the members of his family dies is quite a bit different than a drunk driver killing those passengers. Okay, such accidental deaths because inflicted without intent or desire involve no guilt as confirmed by the words of St. Augustine, the doctor of the church. God forbid that what we do for good and lawful end shall be imputed to us. If contrary to our intention, evil thereby befalls anyone. So see the moral, the moral law is in the divine law. That's the highest law. And all of the state laws, all the civil laws should follow that. But what do we see happening nowadays? Because of certain stigmas, certain um, sensitivities, there are certain laws that are overdone and punish people ridiculously and others that they don't do anything about. So the more serious things that are against the commandments, they should be pursuing. But a lot of those they let to the side. Oh, you had a gun in your home and you accidentally shot this guy. Well, then you're a murder of man. You're guilty of manslaughter. Okay, maybe not. Maybe it was an accident. But see, the sensitivity towards guns and that type of violence. Now, of course, they're going to pursue those things to the last end because that's everything for law. That's everything for justice. And then you look around, and you see all the other injustices being done. And nobody pursues that. I was just reading how the Supreme Court over many years used to be able to say, had a hard time though, because you know our, our justice system is not completely based on the Ten Commandments. It's not completely based on morals. Take abortion, for instance. And then these men in the Supreme Court were trying to decide whether nudity in movies should be allowed. Oh, to this point, they say. To this other point, they say. But you know what happened is some of the justices, I don't know why we're faced with this. We shouldn't be making uh, decisions on this. And he's absolutely right. It's the church who makes those decisions. And then the law, the civil law, follows it. But the church has said what should be done. On these questions of immorality or impurity in Hollywood or in public, but no, you see, they get stuck between freedom of expression. People should be free to express themselves and the person who might be offended. So where is the balance? Oh, you can offend them a little bit. Just don't go too far. 
because then the other person is expressing themselves. So we've got the best of two worlds. You can express yourself as long as you don't offend and scandalize your neighbor too much. And they're trying to make this like splitting a hair in some of these court cases where the point they were frustrated. And I'm thinking to myself, this has already been decided. This is already clear in the mind of the church. Just follow what she says. Follow the Ten Commandments. But see, they, they're, they're hemming and hawing on this. Just take a look. The historical, the historical um, you know, pronouncements back through the Supreme Court from early on. You know, the church used to have a rule and used to have a whole, may I say, uh, institution in looking into literature, movies, yeah, you know, there's a type of index that they use to say what's good for the faithful in this modern world, but that's gone. It's gone. All right, what about killing in self-defense? You're in your house. You're an old man, 70 years old. You got your shotgun there, and a guy enters with his gun or knife. Are you justified in using your shotgun in your home? to defend yourself against this intruder. If a man kill another in self-defense, having used every means consistent with his own safety to avoid the affliction of death, he had a lock on his door. He may have said, back up, mister, get out of my house before I shoot you. If he does all that, he is defending himself. If he's done everything he can to avoid the infliction of death, he evidently does not viol violate the commandment if he has to take more aggressive force. And that's all it says. The Council of Trent keeps it very simple. Everyone is entitled to defend himself. Self-defense is one of your rights. Somebody's going to take your life, take your property, take your family. You have the right to defend it. What about this negative part of the commandment forbidding murder and suicide? The above are cases in which life may be taken without violating the commandment. With these exceptions, all other of killing is forbidden. Whether we consider the person who kills, the person killed, or the means used to kill. As to the persons who kill, the commandment recognizes no exception, whatever, be he rich or powerful, master or parent, all without exception or distinction are forbidden to kill. So it's not just the poor man, the weak man that's forbidden to kill, and therefore the rich man who can do whatever he wants, is, it's all right. No, it's not. Some cultures act that way. Look at the culture of China, right? Now, and of course, they're often under the scrutiny of their humanitarian or lack of humanitarian um, laws or ways of acting towards their, their um, citizens. But it's very well known that the, with the restrictions on how many children they can have, if they have a child, they expose it. They could throw it in the dumpster rather than be fined or put in prison. Yeah, they have enough children, then they take, oh, that little Sally came along. Well, we'll take her and dump her in the dumpster. Out of sight, out of mind. That's murder. But they do it. How many years have they been doing it? And how many years have they had abortions? Willfully killing their innocent. And we do it now through abortion. So with regard to the person killed, the law extends to all. There is no individual, however humble or lowly his condition, whose life is not shielded by this law. And closely allied to this is sterilization. It is known in this United States, even now, that those who are a little bit invalid, those who are not quite right in the mind, they can be sterilized. That's not a joke. It's not something I made up. Just look in the news. Look it up. Sterilization. Is it still legal? Yes. And who can decide who has to be sterilized? Particular doctors? Or... There was even a court case where the courts decided whether these people should be sterilized. It was a daughter and her mother. Because they saw how the mother was, the daughter was tending that way too. Sterilize her. It's against the fifth commandment. And it still exists today. Just ask Bill Gates and his work in Africa. 
any of these big institutions, medical institutions, look around the world and see where they experiment on people. It's usually those who can't complain so much, don't have access to the media, are low, poor, because they have less voice. And that's what we're saying here. It doesn't matter if you're rich or powerful, a master or parent. If you're a killer, you're a killer. If you are a man who's being killed, it doesn't matter if you are lowly, humble, poor, your life is shielded by this law. And then also this law forbids suicide. No man possesses such power over his own life as to be at liberty to put himself to death. And what do we see today in the United States? Many states have lawfully allowed in law the euthanasia of the elderly. Even so, no, it's not so much they're even forcing anybody. They, have, they can force plenty of people. I'll tell you an example in a moment. But in a lot of these states, following Jack Kevorkian, they have now, you know, oh, Mr. So-and-so, wouldn't you like just to rest? You, you've been suffering so much. Why don't you lay down here and look at this nice video, listen to this beautiful music, say goodbye to your family, and we'll just put a little serum into your blood and you'll be gone. You don't have anything to worry about. And does that doctor believe in the afterlife? No, doesn't have to. This life is everything. There's nothing after. Once you put the person to sleep, he goes to sleep, and that's the end of his existence. Whoa, does he have a wake-up call coming? There's heaven and hell to deal with. So also in this old aspect of uh, euthanasia or killing someone, Recently, one of our parishioners had a father who was sick in the hospital, different complications. And the doctors all took a very negative approach saying, okay, we have to put him on comfort care. We have to give him morphine. He's going to be gone soon. And I advised her, no. No, you give the man what is necessary to take the edge off his pain so he doesn't despair. You keep giving him whatever food or nourishment you can by the means that are available without being extraordinary traumatic to him. And you know what? He's still alive. Still alive two weeks later, he would have died. And they would have morph morphinized him. They would have euthanized him with morphine. Who does that? Those who have no conscience. Those who do not follow the moral law. They don't follow the commandments. They follow the policy of the hospital, which is the law right now. We know, we priests. Say to this person, oh, I'd like to come in and see this person. No, the policy of the hospital says this. Oh, well, your work, sorry, your work, your medicines and treatments right now are not working. Can we try something else? No, the policy of the hospital is to stick to this. But the person is dying. That's the policy of the hospital to stick to this. Over and over again. Think outside the box, you want to tell them. Wow. Incredible. So suicide, forbidden. As a matter of fact, Holy Mother Church says that somebody who commits suicide cannot be buried in the church, cannot be given the funeral by the priest or buried with a Catholic ceremony. So what happens? I can tell you an example. If someone ever did that, then the priest would accompany the body to the burial site. It would be put in the ground. He would give it a simple blessing and he would leave. That's it. Well, everything else did denied them. And finally, if we consider the numerous means by which murder may be committed, the law admits no exception. Not only does it forbid to take away the life of another by laying violent hands on him, by either sword, stone, stick, or halter, or whatever, poison, but it also strictly forbids the accomplishment of the death of another by counsel, assistance, help, or any other means, whatever. Well, there we get into the whole question of doctors, and family being totally up to date, and that's to say informed on making moral decisions for their relatives. Always refer to the priest. After you've done and put everything in order and you're working out your living will or your last will and testament or your last end wishes, make sure you consult the priest to make sure they're morally correct. Sinful anger is also forbidden by the fifth commandment. You remember I told you there are a lot of external things forbidden, but also internal. 
what is going on inside my soul when I see my neighbor, when I see this particular thing, person? Am I wishing to kill him, even if I wouldn't do so? Or wishing him some type of harm, sinful anger? The Jews, with singular dullness of apprehension, thought that to abstain from taking life with their own hands was enough to satisfy the obligation imposed by this commandment. But it's not so. Jesus says, the Christian, instructed in the interpretation of Christ, has learned that the precept is spiritual and that it commands us not only to keep our hands unstained, but our hearts pure and undefiled. And hence, what the Jews regarded as quite sufficient, oh, I didn't kill him, is not sufficient for us. For the gospel is taught that it is unlawful even to be angry with anyone. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Just a little bit more here, dear faithful, and then we're going to go on to my last topic. From these words, it clearly follows that he who is angry with his brother is not free from sin, even though he conceals his resentment, that he who gives indication of his wrath sins grievously, that he who does not hesitate to treat another with harshness and to utter continuously reproaches, continuous reproaches against him sins still more grievously. This, however, is to be understood of cases in which no just cause of anger exists. God in his laws permit us to be angry. What's an example? Parents, fathers and mothers can be and should be at times angry with their children to correct them. So what is that for? You have an obstacle. There's an evil and the anger has to overcome the evil. So we have to have that emotion and that passion and God allows that. But it doesn't mean that we turn it into hate. It doesn't mean that we let it go to the point where we hold resentment. The anger is for the moment to correct the bad in order that the good may be done. And that's it. We let go of it. If we don't let go of it, it's bitterness. It's pride. And it come, becomes very sinful. Our Lord has left us many other lessons of instruction with regard to the perfect observance of this law, such as not to resist evil, but if one strike thee on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. And if a man will contend with thee in judgment and take away thy coat, let thy cloak also go with him. And whosoever will force thee one mile, <laughs> go with him too. All right, we need to talk more in another class about some remedies against the violation of this commandment. Then also look at the aspect of love or concord that comes from looking after the things of my neighbor. And just a reminder again, before we move away from the commandment, if we keep this one perfectly, God speaking about God and honoring God at mass, putting our obligation of Sunday first and holy days. If this is done well, it's much easier to do the other commandments towards our neighbor because we got this in order, right? What's the highest of the commandments? Love the Lord thy God. And then to love thy neighbor as yourself. And this really, this bridge really helps us to know our love for our neighbor helps us to know whether we really keep this well. Do we really put God in place and vice versa? If we honor God, then we know how we treat our neighbor. Or how we don't treat our neighbor properly. Okay, I'm going to go on to some words from Wolfgang Smith. Just brief. He wrote a book called Unmasking the Faces of the Antichrist and he wrote a section called part three, how to survive as a Catholic in an anti-Catholic world, how to survive as a Catholic in an anti-Catholic world. So he's asked questions by Bernard Jensen from Triumph Communications, and he answers a few of them. One of the big ones he says is this whole question of our children in college and universities. The question to him was this, you have taught at American universities for many years. Are there dangers to the faith of Catholic students who attend today's universities? And he says, to begin with, universities have been th a threat to the Catholic faith ever since the enlightenment. 
Take the Europe in which I was born, because Wolfgang is German. The true undiluted Catholic faith was to be found, generally speaking, in segments of the population far removed from culturally from the so-called centers of higher education. Meanwhile, the problem has worsened progressively. In Europe, no less than in America, today our universities threaten not only the faith, but one might also say the very sanity of our youth. Professors tend, without exception, to be of radically liberal bent and bias, and even if perchance they admit to being Christians. To give but one example, virtually every member of the academic community in whatever faculty believes nowadays in so-called religious liberty. The notion that we have the unmitigated right of choosing our religious tenets, a claim which theologically makes little sense. Only God could bestow upon us that right, and quite obviously, he has done nothing of the kind. On the contrary, he has revealed religious truths and made it clear that we are henceforth oblig obligated to abide by the commandments they entail. We are free, of course, to do as we will, because we have free will, but we do so at our own risk and peril of our own soul. Yet when it comes to the aficionados of liberty, whether they profess to be Christians or not, this deadly warning falls invariably upon deaf ears. So the acute danger of the faith of Catholic students to which you allude is magnified by the fact that this liberal mentality is highly contagious. It tends to impose itself by contact, so to speak, by mere proximity. What renders this pervasive influence well nigh irresistible, moreover, is the fact that it enjoys, as I have said, the imprimatur of the faculty at large. I'll give you an example. A young man was presenting his doctorate for, as a lawyer. He was putting, putting his thesis together and he was trying to get his doctorate as a lawyer. And he was presenting his thesis to the board on natural law. That fits in well with what we're talking today. And one of the board members, and these are all made up of the faculty where he was doing his thesis, or of others they invited in, professors of other colleges and universities. And one of the women turned to one of the other members and said, do we still believe in the natural law? Yeah. He was dumbfounded. Because what law are you even promoting then? Because we've come up with this thing called positive law. And that's what everybody runs on today. Look at the courts, look at the, the civil governments, they all run on positive law, and they don't reference where that positive law came from, which is natural law. It's an example of how persistent, how pervasive is that in the modern education. He says, typically, the ideas in question, the notion, for instance, that mankind has gradually emancipated itself from superstitious and barbarous beliefs like the Catholic faith through the advances of science are treated as discoveries arrived by the way of that very advanced evolution of mankind. See, mankind is far beyond that old stodginess. Just look at what they said in Vatican II. Look what they say even in the newer writings of the church. Oh, we've evolved far from that, all oh, that old faith, that old traditional mass, that old way of doing things. Well, that's just so old, we don't do that anymore. We've evolved. Same idea. Doesn't, doesn't matter where it's at, whether it's politically, economically, religiously, wherever it is, it's all the same idea, evolution. We've gotten away from that, we're more advanced, we are more man-centered. Let's stand and say our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.